Okay. So we'll start the second uh, lecture of the day about neutrinos. And again, I just want to stress, uh, you did pretty well on the first talk, but uh, I want to stress, ask questions, ask questions, façam perguntas, hagan perguntas. Okay, so uh, I'm, I'm going to start. So uh, I'm, I'm going to be telling you about neutrinos. I have five lectures, so you will see me a lot. If you don't ask questions, you also will hear me a lot, because I talk a lot. So if you don't stop me, I'll just talk a lot. Um, let me just start with the one question that Fabio didn't ask, which is, uh, how many of you work on experiment? Oh, that's very nice. Okay. But it's a void or a third. Or, or with very large error bars. Okay, so my job is to tell you about neutrinos. The way I organize the lectures is a little bit different from the way Fabio is organizing the lectures. And given that a lot of you have heard about particle physics, what I'll talk about today is probably stuff that you've all heard before. But on the other hand, it's nice to hear things that you've heard before because you tend to feel good about understanding everything. So you're supposed to understand absolutely everything. Okay, if you don't understand something, let me know. And uh, this is sort of a sense of the material that I want to try to cover. There are also going to be a couple or, or two or three more lectures related to neutrinos and astrophysics or to some specific topics in neutrino physics, including sterile neutrinos. So what I want to talk mostly about today is I want to give you a sense of the history of the neutrino. The, the neutrino is a very important particle for the, the understanding of particle physics, and it played a big role, in, or it showed up in lots of different places when we started figuring out how particle physics works. So I want to try to give you some sense of that. It will not be a very good history of particle physics. It will be a very biased history where I just pinpoint some instances in the history of science, but hopefully that will be useful. I'm going to separate out uh, uh, the last 50 years of neutrino physics approximately, which is uh, an introduction to how we came to learn that neutrinos have mass. So this is a problem that started in the 1960s, and I'm going to talk about that separately, and hopefully that's what I'll talk about this afternoon. And then uh, I will then try to tell you uh, uh, what's the solution to this uh, new phenomenon that we ran into, and that's a lot related to the physics of neutrino oscillations that ultimately tells us that neutrinos have mass, which is something that happened in the last 20 years or so, and uh, it's still a topic of a lot of research. So Fabio's very worried about the lights for some reason. Okay. And uh, so after I do that, I'm going to try to give you a sense of where we are in terms of neutrino physics. So I'll try to give you a sense of what are the questions that people are very worried about that tend to drive a lot of the experiments that we hear about today. So you hear a lot about the experiments next week, uh, so I won't discuss the details of how the experiments work, because I don't know how to talk about that anyway, but you're going to hear about that next week. Okay? <clears throat> and then towards the end of the week, uh, I'll spend some time talking about why neutrino masses are interesting from a theoretical point of view. And then I'll try to discuss uh, what are many of the ideas that people have had in the context of explaining neutrino masses. And hopefully you get a sense of what explaining neutrino masses mean. And then I'll also talk about what does that mean for the experiments as well. So that's kind of the plan. And uh, I have no idea uh, how the pace of this is going to work out, so we'll kind of... Uh, uh, adjust as we go along. And again, as uh, Martin already said several times, please ask questions of, of any kind. Okay, so that's, the, uh, that's one thing that you want to keep in mind. There's another thing which is very important. Uh, I am probably the most American person you're going to see in this school. So if I say something and you don't understand me, uh, please ask and I can try to say it again. Uh, sorry, North American. Actually, no, let me correct that. Anglo-Saxo-American. <clears throat> there might be some people from Mexico here. Colombia is not in North America, so that's okay. No, 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 North America is Mexico and above, right? There's Central America. Anyway, okay, so that's the, these are the, the, the preparation things. So uh, the next slide, again, is uh, 
I, I, the assumption is that by the end of this week, you're going to get copies of this. So here is a, an incomplete and ridiculously biased list of references that try to summarize the status of neutrino physics. Um, neutrino physics is really exciting because it's been changing very quickly. On the flip side, there's no textbook that talks about these things because we haven't had time to do that yet. You know, the subject has been changing a lot. Uh, this is starting to get better. There are a couple of interesting textbooks in the market, uh, but a lot of the information is included in uh, uh, lecture notes that people have written, uh, uh, you know, progress reports or uh, physics reports and things like that. And there's a lot of very good ones. So if you remove the ones that I've worked on, the, the other ones are good by definition because I chose them. And uh, some of them are, are actually interesting. Okay, so let me get started. So again, my job today is, to, yeah, yeah. Bias means that it's not a complete list, and it's a list of things that I like. And, it's, uh, and, and by definition, everything that I do, I like, because if I didn't like it, I wouldn't do it. That's true of everybody, by the way. Everybody that will give you a lecture this week or next week, let's put it that way. Little maybe, okay, so that's, that's what I mean by biased. So any other questions? Okay, so uh, I want to get started with this uh, a brief history of particle physics and how neutrinos play a role. And this is a sort of, I will tell you lots of stories, and these are the sorts of stories that you should have heard about at some point when you were learning about particle physics. Okay, so it is very, very possible that you've heard some of these stories before. I will tell you that half of what I say probably isn't true, but it doesn't matter. It's the story that counts. It's not the details that count in a lot of detail. But I want to start out the story in a place which is very familiar to most of you, which is at the end of the 19th century. And this is one of these great stories in modern physics. So I do want to tell you about that. And that's the discovery of natural radioactivity. Okay, so the person mostly strongly associated to that is this uh, French person. Henri uh, Becquerel, and uh, he worked in Paris. And I assume everybody has heard the story before, so I will tell you my version of that story. And, uh, and again, uh, these stories are very, very important. I mean, I, I, just to say something very serious, knowing these stories is very important. It gives you a sense of how science works. It lets you know uh, uh, how we got to think about something in a certain way. It also gives you a sense of... Uh, the fact that uh, scientific evolution is very, very nonlinear, and we make a lot of mistakes, and that uh, we make some hypotheses that turn out to be wrong, and we stick to the wrong hypothesis for 20 years, 30 years, until eventually we learn what the right answer is and so on. So that's why knowing these factoids and, and how these things happen is very important, because it gives you a, a, a more human sense of how uh, uh, science works. Okay, so getting that out of the way, the discovery of radioactivity is a very interesting story. So this guy, Becquerel, he was working in Paris, and uh, what the phenomenon he was studying was phosphorescence. Okay, so phosphorescence is a physical phenomenon, and it turns out that there's some materials that if you expose them to light, they will shine light on their own afterwards. So you take this material, you expose it to light, and then you bring it back inside the room, and it will emit light. So that's what this guy was studying. He had one of these materials that would phosphoresce, and uh, he was studying them. Uh, one day he was going to do his experiment, and the weather was bad, which happens a lot in Paris. If you've ever been to Paris, that's kind of a constant. So there he was, the weather was bad, so he took his sample, he put it in a drawer to do the experiment the next day, except that he was going away on a trip. If you have a boss, they go away on trips a lot, so physicists travel a lot. So he went away on a trip, he forgot about his experiment, and then one day he remembered and he looked, he opened the drawer and he checked that he had left the sample inside of a drawer for a long time, and it turned out that this, uh, this sample that he was studying actually had been left on top of some photographic plates. So, you know, so people had invented photography by then, 
and you had these photographic plates. Uh, and then he had left the sample on top of the photographic plates. And all of this was inside of a drawer for a very long time. So he said, hmm, you know, these plates probably have gone bad. So he decided to develop the plates anyway. And then he found out, and this is a, 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 not, not a picture, but what it could look like. Here's a photographic plate. No, you know, the little box with, uh, this was a, an uranium salt. It was some uh, material that was very uh, uh, rich on uranium. So when he developed the photographic plate, there was a big bright spot where the box had been. And he thought, this is really strange. And then he decided to do the experiment again, except in a more controlled way. And basically what he found out was that if you took this uranium salt, it would emit some form of energy that would leave an imprint in a photographic plate all by itself. You didn't have to do anything. This is a really remarkable discovery. We had no idea that this could happen. It's totally magic. So it means that there are materials that can emit some form of energy by themselves. I mean, we know how lights work. They knew how lights work. But that all involves a lot of work, right? You have to, uh, you have to excite the material first before it does something. So we know how light bulbs work, for example. You have to run a current through it so that the light comes out. Or you have to put you know, a gas in some electric field so that you excite the atom so that the light comes out. These materials would do that just by themselves which is absolutely remarkable. And of course, it's a radiation that we can't see. And that's also something that's important. Uh, people were getting, this must have been an exciting time in some journals in physics, although they probably didn't have too many journals back then. Uh, uh, X-rays were also discovered in, the, in around the same time scale. X-rays are very interesting because they are a kind of radiation that's uh, way outside of the electromagnetic spectrum that we can see. And that's uh, really important. And they're not thermal. You know, thermal radiation we knew about because we can, we can feel that. And then x-rays are on the other side of the spectrum. And that was also very exciting, also happening at the same time. And I'm talking about natural radioactivity a lot because that's very important for neutrinos. Okay? Now, what comes next is just a very, very basic science. So people started to characterize this radiation. Again, it's a radiation that you can't see but it leaves an imprint in a photographic plate. So that means you can do experiments. So people did experiments, and again, for the next uh, decade or so, they figured out that the radiation comes in three types. Okay? You've all heard about these types. You probably learn about this in high school, or you should learn about this in high school a little bit. You know, the three types are called alpha radiation, beta radiation, and gamma radiation. Why do they have these names? Because these are the, the names you would come up with if you were listing something. Right? You know, it's radiation A, B, and C, but you do it in Greek because it sounds nicer. And of course, what they did was they measured different properties of the radiation. And there are a couple of important properties that they measured. One, and again, this, is, uh, this comes from how they did the experiments. One thing that you could try to do was this radiation was coming out of this material. So one, one way of characterizing the radiation that they came up with was uh, they wanted to know how penetrating the radiation was. So that means if you have radiation that comes out of a material, you can see if you can stop it with something. So for example, alpha radiation you can stop with a piece of paper. So if you have an, an alpha emitting source and you put a piece of paper, the radiation doesn't come through the paper. That's alpha radiation. It's very, very non-penetrating. It's very easy to stop. Beta radiation is harder to stop, and gamma radiation is hardest to stop. So gamma radiation can go through a lot of material, a, a beta radiation through a lot more material than alpha radiation. Alpha radiation stops a lot. Okay. The other thing that they figured that they were start trying to study, and that's related to point two in that list there, uh, the year after we discovered natural radioactivity, uh, we discovered the electron. So the electron was identified as a, an object with a certain charge and mass uh, 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 in, in 1897. So if you want, the electron is the oldest uh, fundamental particle that we know. And that's when it was discovered. They've been around for a long time, but it took us a long time to find them. 
And that again is another really impressive set of experiments that lead to this. We knew about currents, we knew about ionizing matter already. So if you take material and you put it in an, in an electric field, you can get these uh, fluxes of matter that go towards the positive end or the negative end. And the electron is one of those. What goes to the other end are the ions, but those are very messy things. Okay, so going back to the electromagnetic radio or to the uh, radioactivity, uh, people, people would ask whether these uh, types of radiation were charged. Okay, so that was the other question you can ask. And here's an experiment that you can do. So you can take your photographic plate here on top of a table, like here. You put your uh, radioactive source over here, and then you place all of this in a magnetic field. So what you find is that there's some of the radiation that does this if you place it in a magnetic field, and then there's some of the radiation that does this if you place it in a magnetic field, and then there's some of the radiation that just goes straight. Okay? So what tells you is that one type of radiation is positively charged, another type of radiation is negatively charged, and then the other type of radiation doesn't have any charge. Okay, so that's what people were figuring out. Of course, uh, if you know your magnetic field, you can learn more about the thing that's being emitted, including how heavy it is. Okay, so what they find is that there's some... Uh, there's a, a, you know, one type of radiation is very easy to bend, and the other one is harder to bend, and that says something about the mass. Okay? Is this very, very clear to everybody? That's just very basic. You know, so with the thing you learn in first year physics, you could have done all these experiments and become famous. Sadly, we weren't around, but these people did a lot of this work, which is very impressive. Uh, there's a lot of experimental work that's very non-trivial here because you want to have a source that's... So all of these sources are isotropic, so the, the radiation goes everywhere. So if you, want to radi if you want to get a beam of radiation, that takes a certain ingenuity to figure this out as well. Okay? So these are the different types of radiation. And of course, uh, we all know very, very well about what these things are. And it took them a very long time to figure out what these, these types of radiation were. There's one thing that people should know, is that these are actually electrons. This gamma radiation is uh, photons, or gamma rays, so the name hasn't changed. We still call the photon gamma because of gamma radiation. And this one here probably took longer to figure out. Alpha, alpha radiation is quite heavy, and as you know, these are helium nuclei. Okay? So is everybody really f familiar with this? And again, th this is not something that was discovered overnight. This took a very long time, and again, it probably took a couple of decades, and a lot of people working on probably very, very bad environments to do these experiments, because all of this is very bad for you. But that's a different problem. Okay, so the continuation of our story is all related to beta radiation. Okay, and that's uh, probably another story that I hope everybody has heard before many times, but it's also a very important story. So I, I, I do want to give you a sense of uh, what was going on, maybe in more detail than you've heard before. But basically, uh, People were very clever, so they keep on doing these experiments. And in particular, you know uh, that if you assume that all electrons are the same, when they come out of this uh, beta-emitting source, uh, the amount by which they curve in this magnetic field will depend on the energy that the electron has. Right? So you can literally do the experiment of just putting your source here, and then seeing where the electrons land, and that will give you a spectrum. Right? So, for example, you can do it with the alpha particles. The alpha particle comes out, it has a certain energy, it lands over here. If it has a more energy, it lands over here. So you can do a spectrum. So you can, you can ask the question, what are all the possible energies that, that, that the electron can have? So they did these experiments very early on, 
And the answer they got was really, really confusing. And it turns out it's very confusing and it's a really long story because these measurements are not very good measurements. This is not a very good experiment to do in this way. So basically, after people did a lot of experiments, uh, so remember, radioactivity is discovered before the turn of the century. Uh, by 1914, people were very sure that the spectrum that comes out of beta radiation is continuous. That means that the electron that comes out is allowed to have any energy it wants, up to some bound. Okay, so basically, you do the experiment, and here's the energy, here's the number of beta electrons that you get, or some differential number, and you get some spectrum that looks like that. This is actually a very long story, and, and I do want to say, just figuring out that this is true took, a, took 10 years. Just doing this measurement correctly, because when you do this measurement, it never looks like that. It always looks like you know, some cluster here, some cluster here, and some gaps, because things didn't work very well. So it was a big mess. So it took a very famous, very good experimentalist to do this. Uh, this is a Mr. Chadwick. I think he's either English or Scottish. But just so he's British. No, this is 1914. Lisa Meitner is a little bit older, but that's for the different story, I think. But maybe I'm wrong. I could be wrong. Uh, so, because this story is much longer. So, so the, the question is, is it a continuous spectrum? That was a hard thing to decide. And the other part is that this is the wrong answer. This is not the answer that people wanted. Okay? And uh, this is part of the reason why it took them a long time to accept that the spectrum was continuous, because everybody thought that you should get a discrete spectrum. Alpha radiation, by the way, does that. Uh, and we also know about, for example, the spectrum of uh, 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 excited hydrogen. So if you take a hydrogen atom and you excite that, it emits the light back again, and you get this uh, discrete spectrum, right? So you get these uh, spectrums of light. And you may have had to do this experiment in the lab to check where all the lines are. And every element has a different set of spectra. And we heard from Fabio's lecture that these spectra turn out to be really important for astronomy, for example. That's how you measure a bunch of stuff. So the beta spectrum, on the other hand, is uh, discrete. I'm sorry. The beta spectrum is continuous, but they expected it to be discrete. So it took them a long time to figure out what was going on there. And this was a huge problem in physics. Again, this was established in the 1910s that the spectrum that you got was continuous. And uh, nobody expected that. And the real problem was that when people started to come up with an explanation for how these radioactive processes work, uh, they got an answer that didn't make any physics sense. Okay? So basically, if you go back to, uh, to this world here, where you've identified what these types of radiation look like, then your next, next job as a scientist is to ask, how does that happen? What's going on here? What's the physics? So you need to come up with some physics model that explains uh, what's going on here. Gamma radiation is a, a separate story, but it was a story that people were already having to worry about just in regular electromagnetic processes. So, for example, we know that if you excite uh, the hydrogen atom, it de-excites by emitting gamma radiation. So, if you go back to what was going on around those days, uh, quantum mechanics was being invented, and people also had to invent a physics description of how do you emit electromagnetic radiation spontaneously. So, we knew how to do that, or we we were learning how to do that um, better and better. So gamma radiation kind of could fall into that same box, that something was going on inside of your nucleus, and that there was some uh, capability of emitting electromagnetic radiation. So that works out fine. Alpha and beta radiation are harder. And uh, alpha radiation, and again, this is a... Uh, the reason this is all really hard is... Uh, so this is the birth of nuclear physics. So atomic physics is uh, 
born at around the same time, and that's what quantum mechanics was, uh, in many quotes, invented for. And, but atomic phenomena are relatively low energy phenomena uh, in a really big system. So atoms are really big in these units. And uh, we could start doing experiments with atoms where you could try to figure out how big the atoms were. Uh, you could, you know, excite electrons out. You can strip out electrons and ionize atoms and so on. And the problem with these phenomena here is that they're related with nuclei. Nuclei are really small. And they're very, very hard to probe and very, very hard to study experimentally. And this is something that you want to keep in mind. Uh, in, in physics, we like to talk about energies. You know, so we, energies describe sizes of things. So atoms are uh, electron volt style energies and you know, around an electron volt. And uh, nuclear physics phenomena are you know, hundreds of kilo electron volts to mega electron volts. So it's many, many orders of magnitude much harder to study. So again, figuring out how the nucleus works uh, took longer because we didn't have any direct access to what was going on inside of the nucleus. And it took us a long time to have the machines that could study nuclear phenomena properly. Okay, so nu and, and the other thing, which is, uh, this is a really big aside, uh, if you want to probe inside of a, an atom, you need some probe that has a very small wavelength. And uh, we could come up with these probes uh, you know, in the supermarket. You, know, you can get materials that would emit x-rays. Or we could place something in a strong electric, electromagnetic field to start emitting x-rays. So you can probe things with x-rays, for example. If you want to probe things with uh, uh, MeV energies, that doesn't come out of the supermarket. You have to work, work much harder for that. You had to build a machine that could eventually take, you know, give enough energy to a probe so you could start asking questions at the MEV level. But that, that took a long time. That took much longer. Okay. So going back to understanding what was going on here, for example, uh, uh, the way that we understand alpha radiation, which is more or less correct, is that alpha radiation comes out of big nuclei. So I, I'm not saying anything you don't know. But if I do say something you don't know, ask. So alpha radiation comes out of really big nuclei. Well, they have to be very big. And uh, the best way of, of a very simple but not wrong way of talking about uh, alpha radiation is to say in many quotes that the alpha particle lives inside of the nucleus. And if the conditions are just right, this alpha particle can, can escape the nucleus uh, uh, by itself. It's a tunneling phenomenon in quantum mechanics. So I, I assume everybody has learned quantum mechanics. So there's a good chance that many of you have done a, a, a tunneling calculation for alpha radiation because it's one of these uh, homework problems you can do. So you, you imagine that the nucleus is described by a potential barrier, and then the alpha particle lives inside of the nucleus, but it, it's in an, you know, so you have some potential that looks like this, and, uh, and then you have, you know, the nucleus is made out of some pieces that includes an alpha particle. So imagine that there's an alpha particle inside of the nucleus that has this much energy. So if it has this much energy inside of the nucleus, it has a non-zero probability of being found over here, and if that happens, it just uh, tunnels out. Okay? Has everybody heard this story before? And again, this is a homework problem you can do in uh, you know, uh, undergraduate quantum mechanics. So the picture for alpha radiation then is to say that this alpha particle lives inside of the nucleus. So inside of a big nucleus, you can in some sense describe it as it contains alpha particles. If you're unhappy with this picture and you like the modern picture of the nucleus being made out of protons and neutrons, what happens is that in Every once in a while, two protons and two neutrons can choose to get together and, and escape. And that's kind of how alpha radiation works. But the key point is that the alpha radiation lives inside of the nucleus. The alpha particle, the thing that's being emitted, lives inside of the nucleus. Okay? That picture works quite well. The gamma radiation, I said, uh, is something that we were coming to grips with, but the best description we have of that 
is also something that's very strange, if you've thought about it for a little bit. But basically, the model that we have is that you have a nucleus, and then the nucleus can choose to take some of its energy and create a, a photon out of, out of nothing, and then the photon runs away. That's the model. And, and magically, it's actually true. So we can create particles out of nothing, which is very strange, but that's how it works. So people were coming to grips with that because of the way that we describe things like uh, the hydrogen atom, for example. So the hydrogen atom is a similar story. When the electron jumps from one level to the other, it takes that energy and creates a new particle and makes that go away, and that, that's emitted. And we don't worry too much about that, but people invented a theory that describes that uh, you know, in, the, in the early 19, uh, 1900s. So now, beta radiation are electrons. So the key question is, where are these electrons coming from? Okay, so that's a good question. And the answer is, they, they live inside of the nucleus too. That's what people thought. Okay, this is very important because uh, you can't create an electron out of nothing. Right? Why is that? Well, no, so, well, I, I told you that I can create a photon out of nothing. That's okay. And the photon has momentum. But what's, what's, why can't I do that with the electron without worrying about more things? They have the charge. So charge conservation is important, and we can't violate charge conservation. So creating an electron out of nothing uh, is very troublesome. So we have to either create it together with other things going on at the same time, or to be safe, you, you say that the electron is already inside of the nucleus. Yeah. So if you do it in a way that you, uh, that you conserve energy and momentum, that's okay, right? So again, think about the regular hydrogen atom. So you, have, uh, you excite your electron to the 2p state, then the electron jump, you know, you've heard about this before, the electron jumps back to the 1s state and emits a photon. Very well-known photon. So that's okay. Now the photon goes out in some direction with some momentum and energy. So we know where the energy is coming from. So we know that the, the, the nucleus has to recoil. And that's okay. You can conserve energy and momentum that way. Of course, yeah, but here the, the nucleus can do that. So alpha, alpha radiation would be like that. So, so when, you, when you eject this alpha particle, uh, you recoil to conserve energy and momentum. Okay, but that's, that's a good question. And uh, so again, you know, the, the idea was that uh, the electrons lived inside of the nucleus, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Now, the energy and, and momentum conservation concern comes with the spectra. So this is the... That's the really important question, which is, uh, this is a calculation you could do for the, for the alpha particle, but we're going to do it for the, this beta particle, for this beta emission. So the, the beta emission process looks like this. So it's some nucleus that decays into a different nucleus plus an electron, and the electron comes out with some kinetic energy. Okay? So this is the best description we have of this physics process. And again, this is a we know this has to be a different nucleus because of conservation of charge. And the thing which is really important, so think about this as uh, in parallel to uh, alpha radiation emission, which is something that looks like that. So this is what alpha radiation means. Now, what's interesting about this process here, or this process, it's the same, is that you can calculate... Uh, the properties that the system can have if you assume energy and momentum conservation. And the key point is you know, let's say you have a nucleus N at rest, it decays, one electron goes out one way, uh, the nucleus recoils the other way, you impose energy and momentum conservation, and this is a, you can do this using classical mechanics even, if you don't care about relativity. Uh, the system is constrained enough that if you assume that you know the masses of everything involved and you assume energy conservation and momentum conservation, uh, you can calculate the energy that the electron comes out with. 
the energy is not an optional amount of energy, it's a fixed amount of energy. Okay? So you can do the calculation, and that means that if you, if you believe in this model here, then the electrons should all come out with energy, energy that's this much. So some delta function right over here. Okay? That's what energy momentum conservation tells you. So basically, having a, discrete, a, a continuous spectrum is weird because all of the quantum mechanical phenomena that you observe give you discrete spectra. So why would this be any different? And on top of that, this spectrum here seems to violate conservation of energy and momentum because the electron comes out with less energy than it's supposed to. Okay? So people knew about all of this, and that's why they didn't want these spectra to be continuous, because it didn't, it didn't match our understanding of energy momentum conservation. Okay? Is this clear for everybody? Okay? Now, imagine that you were doing this experiment, and you got to this point where you measure the spectrum here, and you expected all of your electrons to come out with this energy. The interesting question is, what's going on here? So what's the, what's the answer? I mean, don't, don't tell me the right answer, because you know what the right answer is. The, the right answer is a very non-intuitive answer. There are much more plausible answers that you can come up with. Just by staring at this plot, you know, if I told you, I know, I have some physics phenomenon, there are some particles coming out, I think they should all have this energy, they all come out with different energies. So how can that happen? What's that? That's also a very, very uh, dramatic solution. Let's say you got the physics right. The question is, could this happen? Yeah, that's of course what could happen, right? If you're the experimentalist and you did your experiment, you said, hey, my electrons are losing energy as they're coming out. That sounds totally plausible. Okay? So that's what everybody believed, because it makes perfect sense. So it took people about a decade to convince themselves that you couldn't explain this with electron energy loss. This is a really, really hard experiment now. Because remember, you have a nucleus that's emitting an electron, of course, you don't get to do the experiment with one nucleus. You have to do it with a lot of nuclei inside of some material that has a lot of junk in it. And then you have to ask yourself, how do I know that the electron is not losing energy along the way? And there are lots of ways of doing that. You know, there's a theory answer, which is you can calculate how much energy you think the electron is losing as a function of, of distance, for example. That's a hard calculation. And it really relies on you understanding the material very well, which in 1920 was not very well. But you could try to estimate that, and you were off by a lot. And then you can be very clever. Uh, you can ask questions like, so if I have my material that's emitting beta radiation, and the electron is losing energy, that energy has to go somewhere. So maybe your material heats up. So you could try to measure that. You, know, you, you can see, you can ask, how much energy am I losing? That energy has to heat stuff up, and maybe that's what's going on. There's another thing you can do, which is you can change the, the geometry of your material. You can make your material really thin or really thick, and then you can see if the spectra would change. And again, that took a very long time and a lot of very clever experimentalists, until eventually, by the mid-1920s, they were very, 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 very sure that the real spectra looked like this. There was not some uh, a measuring problem that was leading to this puzzle. And that's, the, that's why, again, this is a very long process between you discovering a new phenomenon, measuring something weird, convincing yourself that it's really weird, and then uh, having to talk about uh, uh, what else is going on. So let me give you a picture of what was going on, because this is a really big problem. It's a much bigger problem than just energy momentum conservation, and I want to remind you of that. And it has to do with how we understood nuclear physics. So remember, we knew about hydrogen atoms. We knew the nucleus of a hydrogen atom was uh, what we call today a proton. 
And we knew, or we figured out, that the masses of nuclei were approximately uh, you know, integer units of proton masses. That's a big hint that you can make up nuclei by just having more and more protons inside. That's a very non-trivial phenomenon, and it turns out to be almost correct. You know, maybe we were unlucky because it works really well. So that means you want to make up a, a nucleus like helium. Helium is four times heavier than hydrogen. So you basically say, so the helium atom now has uh, four protons inside instead of just one. Now this clearly doesn't work because you get the wrong charge. But you can fix that by putting electrons inside of the nucleus. And if you put two electrons inside of this nucleus with four protons, then you get something with charge two, which is a helium nucleus or an alpha particle. And you get the right mass, the electron is really light. And then you say that there's some new force which binds the system together. That last statement I just made is still how we understand nuclear physics anyway. But that's the model. We, knew, we know the electrons are there because of beta radiation. So this works, and it, it's an amazing model because it predicts many things. The problem is, it predicts some things that are wrong. Wrong in some big way. Not a little bit wrong, but very wrong. And uh, the thing which is the, the wrongest is uh, that if you make up nuclei in this way, for certain nuclei, you would violate the, the spin statistics theorem. The spin statistics theorem says that things with half integer spin are fermions, and things with integer spin are bosons. So what this means is, effectively, if you start combining nuclei as combinations of protons and electrons, for some nuclei, you get that the thing is a fermion when it's known that it's a boson or the other way around. The classic example of that is nitrogen-14, which in this model, it's made out of 14 protons and 7 electrons. And uh, that would tell you that nitrogen-14 is a fermion because it has an odd number of protons and electrons. But sadly, nitrogen-14 is a boson. Chemists knew that by doing experiments that I don't want to talk about. Okay? This is a qualitatively big problem. It's not, a, it's not that you measure something you, and you get the answer wrong by a factor of two. It's that you get the wrong kind of particle. It behaves totally differently at low temperatures, for example. That's a big problem. There's another problem, which is... Uh, a, a more quantitative problem, which is the following. It has to do with magnetic moments. So everybody knows what a magnetic moment is. So uh, I will remind you. It has to do with the fact that if you place an object that has an intrinsic angular momentum in a magnetic field, and then that object will tend to align with the magnetic field, and the strength of that interaction is proportional to the magnetic moment. Okay? So is everybody very familiar with that? So we know, for example, the electron has a magnetic moment, the proton has a magnetic moment, uh, the neutron has a magnetic moment. And here's the problem. The electron magnetic moment is way bigger than the proton magnetic moment. By a lot. Okay? So is, is that something that makes sense? Or at least believe me that that statement is true. So the problem is, if you measure, say, the magnetic moment of uh, helium, it won't work because helium has no spin, so you get nothing. But if you take your favorite nucleus that has spin, and you measure the magnetic moment, it has a non-zero magnetic moment. And the magnetic moment is of order the proton magnetic moment. So take your favorite nucleus. Again, uh, uh, I don't know, carb, no carb. I always think of spinless ones. but. Take a sp you know, fluor, fluor, fluorine or something like that. That has a spin. So uh, you measure the magnetic moment. The magnetic moment is of order the proton magnetic moment. And remember, the electron magnetic moment is way bigger by about a factor of a thousand. So the key question is, if I have a nucleus that is made out of protons and electrons, how can the electron magnetic moment contribution not win? Okay, so, you know, if I take a bunch of things that have a non-trivial magnetic moment and I combine them together, the combined magnetic moment, this is in many, many quotes because uh, combining spins is difficult. But nonetheless, you would expect the thing with the largest magnetic moment to win. 
And here the electron is not winning, and it has to, to really vanish by a big amount. And that's really complicated, because again, if you look at this nitrogen-14 example, it has an odd number of electrons, so you can't even imagine that the electrons are pairing up in a way that their total spin cancels out. There's one electron left out. So that electron should, should give you all of the magnetic moment of nitrogen. By the way, nitrogen, I, I don't remember the spin, but it's certainly not a half. But. So that's a really big problem. Okay? And again, these are not small problems, these are big problems. So what's the solution to, this, to these very, very big problems? The, the accepted solution is that electrons inside of nuclei are weird. Okay, that's the solution. And it kind of makes sense because it's the electrons that are doing everything wrong. They have the wrong magnetic moment, they have the wrong spin, and they violate energy momentum conservation. Okay? So that's clearly what the answer is. And uh, it's a really stupid answer but it's the best answer that people had at the time. Again, if you've read the slide, uh, the very bottom of that slide, this is a quote from a textbook. It's not a research paper, it's a textbook that you would learn in class, probably in a graduate class. It's written by Gamov. He's a very, very famous physicist who did lots of things right. And you know, I hope you've all heard about him. He's, he has some very, very nice uh, popular physics books, too, that should be required reading for physicists as well. So if you've never read those books, you should go read that and then come back. But the idea is that uh, this is happening at the end of a chapter in nuclear physics, when he's talking about all the things, all the properties that bound electrons have to have, and they have to have the different magnetic moment and the different spin, so he says, you know, by the time we've gotten here, you know, pretending that these electrons can violate energy momentum conservation is not a surprise. Because they do everything else wrong, they might as well not conserve energy and momentum. Again, this is a, this is a really bad solution to a very difficult problem, but it was the, the accepted solution at the time. Because again, we're trying to understand nuclei, which are very small, and the only way we get information from the nuclei is that every once in a while it starts to shed things that we can measure. And we didn't have a lot of information on what was going on internally in these nuclei. So, this is where we were. This is 1930. And, and I do want to give you a sense of how slow things are. Again, these discrete spectra came up in like 1915 that they were confirmed as a problem. Then it took 10 more years to make sure that it was not an experimental problem. And then the theory solutions were very uh, uh, interesting. So this is where neutrinos physics comes in. So this is another story that everybody knows, but it's an important story, so I'll tell you again. So what happened was, so uh, faced with this very, very peculiar problem, uh, uh, Wolfgang Pauli uh, came up with a solution that was very different. And again, this is uh, another very famous story and I'll just tell you the details in a little bit. Uh, this is not a paper, so there's no paper by Pauli that, that postulates the existence of a new particle. And uh, it was supposed to be a talk at a conference, except that he couldn't go to the conference. So he sent his friend, and, and, and he sent the friend with a letter. So his friend went to the conference and read this letter out loud in the conference. And that was the the invention of a new particle that turns out to be correct. So this is a, an, an English translation of the letter. So Pauli was supposed to be a funny guy. And uh, I'm not going to read the whole thing through, but it's a very important document. It's very short, and it does lots of things which are very important for understanding science. So what he starts out with is he tells us what the problem is. And again, uh, the problem is the continuous spectra, but even before he talks about this, he mentions this, uh, the fact that we're getting the nuclei wrong. Now, it's kind of a, I'm sure that's not true, but basically he says that, you know, nitrogen-14 and lithium-6 had the wrong statistics. By the way, this is Pauli. He invented the spin statistics theorem. 
So he cares about that a lot. He wants that to be right. That's not true. He, they already knew it was right. And there's a lot of funny things that he talks about what was going on with the model. So then, his postulation is very simple. He says that, let's say that, that it's this line here that's wrong. So this is the part that I'm getting wrong. And then maybe beta decay is a different process. And maybe another particle is emitted in the same process. That's his idea. A very simple idea. And then, that why would you do that? You would do that because if, you, if this is a three-body decay and not a two-body decay, and you ask what are the energies that the electron can have, the electron can have at most this energy when this new particle comes, in, comes out with no energy, and it usually has a lot less energy. And this energy here gets to be shared between those two particles, and it can be shared in a continuous way. There's no, it, you don't get a spectrum out, you don't get discrete lines out of this, you get a continuum out of this. So it's a great idea, and of course, after you come up with a new particle, you have to do phenomenology. That means you have to say, why is this model not ruled out? So he does that, it's also in the letter. So basically he says, how come we don't know this? This is clearly a qualitatively different thing that's going on, and there's some other particle that's coming out. So what this means is that this new particle has to be light, because if it were heavy, it would leave a different imprint in the kinematics. And it has to be really hard to detect, because if it were easier to detect, we would have seen it by now. So he has a big discussion about uh, what the properties of this new particle can be. Uh, of course, this particle has to have a name, and the name of the particle, of course, is neutron because this particle has no charge, right? So that's an obvious name. You know, we had the proton, the electron. This is a neutron. It has no charge, okay? So you come up with what properties this thing must have in order to explain what's going on, and everything works out fine. You can say more. This particle has to have spin a half. And the reason you would do that is that now, in my uh, nucleus, which if you remember is a bag of protons and electrons, I have these new particles inside as well. And if they have spin a half, I can get to build any nucleus I want. Because I can fix the spin by adding these particles, basically. So I can fit that to experiment really well. So it's a perfect model. Okay, this works really well. And of course, uh, if you start reading the third, the last paragraph of the letter, uh, Pauli is very, very uneasy with this idea. There are many theories about why he didn't go to the conference. One is that he was kind of ashamed to, to say this. I don't believe that, but that's what people say. By the way, if you read the very end of the letter, he had to go to a party, so he couldn't go to the conference. That's what he says, you know, so he had to be at a ball in a different city. So that's how that worked out. But he, he is very, very uneasy to make this uh, 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 hypothesis because he, uh, he was very unhappy that he's inventing a new particle that you couldn't detect. So that was really bad. So in physics, we've evolved a lot. Nowadays, we invent tons of particles that we can't detect, and we're very happy about that. We even get to write papers and so on. So this is the idea. It's a very simple idea. And uh, then uh, uh, history continues, and something really impressive happened Two years after this letter, this letter is in December of 1930, and in 1932, uh, uh, Chadwick, again, the same guy, he discovered a neutron, you know, the neutron that you know about. So there's another kind of radiation, so if you want to continue with this radiation language, there's another kind of radiation you can get out of uh, nuclear processes. That one seldom comes out by itself, but it's a neutron. It's another neutral kind of radiation, but it's super heavy, and it stops a lot. So a neutrons are another kind of radiation, and that was associated with a new particle. And that particle was discovered in 1932. So then there's another story, which is also very famous, that hopefully you've all heard before. So the idea is this happened in 1932. It, shortly after that happened, Fermi was giving a talk in Italy about the neutron. 
So he was saying, hey, the neutron is this great idea, blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera. And then somebody asked a question. So I said, hey, two years ago, uh, Pauli talked about this particle, the neutron, that was coming out of beta decay, and now Chadwick has discovered this particle neutron. Are they the same particle? And then Fermi said, no, 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 these are not the same particle. They have to be different. The particle that, uh, that Pauli postulated is very light. So it's not the neutron, it's a small neutron. Of course, uh, this all happened in Italian, which is much nicer. So this is the name of the particle. So if, if you're fluent in Italian or any Latin language, which I think everybody here is, this just means a small neutron. That's, a, that's all it means. And then the name stuck, let's say. Okay, so it's called a neutrino. And uh, the, 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 the evolution of language in particle physics is also very interesting. So for example, if you do theory, and you know about supersymmetric theories, then you know that all of the new supersymmetric particles that have spin a half are supposed to end in I and O, in this uh, eno suffix. And that's supposed to mean spin a half, and not small. They're actually quite heavy. So you have the neutralinos, and the charginos, and the photinos, and the bino, and the wino, and the gravitino. These are all very heavy particles, unlike the neutrino. And they, they're called Eno because they have spin a half, which the neutrino does have, so that part works out. So this is a story in 1932, and then uh, lots of interesting things happen. And uh, a very, very important thing that happened was uh, Fermi again, this time uh, not giving an interview, but actually writing a theory. And he was the first one to write a theory for beta decay. And he wrote a qualitatively different, very revolutionary theory which is characterized in that Lagrangian there, or that Hamiltonian. And, and I'll tell you what the idea was. So, we are now in the 1930s. We have gotten much, much more clever. So we can describe uh, uh, fundamental particle physics processes, including uh, the emission of gamma rays, and we have uh, you know, relativistic models for how to describe stuff like that. Quantum field theory is not around yet, but it's around the corner. So. Uh, here's uh, 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 Fermi's idea, and by the way, it comes along with uh, a much, much nicer description of nuclei. But his idea was he knew about uh, how to describe, say, el electromagnetic currents, you know, so how two electrons interact. And uh, this is in modern language, but they had a, they had a perturbation theory version of this. Uh, and in, in modern particle physics, we would write a Feynman diagram that looks like this. And the idea is the electron comes along, it exchanges a photon with the other electron. Right? That's the picture everybody has seen, even if you've never taken quantum field theory. And the way that people describe this is uh, in a slightly different language is that there's a, there is a current defined by one electron moving along. There is a current defined by the other electron moving along. And it's those two currents that interact. Okay, so hopefully people are modestly familiar with that. So that's the, that's the language that people were using at the time. So what Fermi postulated was that the weak interactions were also a current-current interaction, except that he allowed for the possibility that these currents could be uh, uh, weird. So basically what he said was, I could have an interaction where I have a current that looks like this, And, uh, well, I'm going to do this wrong, so let's put the proton here. So basically, he invented the concept of a, a, a particle type violating current. And also a current that can change charge. So I can have a current where the proton transforms into a neutron, and at the same time, because charge has to be conserved, this current has to interact with a different current where the electron transforms into a neutrino. So this is a, this is a, a very, very crazy idea because it tells you that the particles can change type. So particles can morph into a different particle. 
This is as dramatic as inventing, uh, creating a particle out of thin air, like a photon. But it's, uh, it's a slightly different variant on something very unusual that can happen. So this is what uh, Fermi came up with as a description of how do you describe beta decay. Beta decay, by the way, is the process moving along this way. So the neutron decays into a proton, emitting an electron and a neutrino, which in our language would be an anti-neutrino, but we'll talk about that a lot more later on. But this is what uh, uh, Pauli postulated. This is very, very important for lots of things. One is that if you believe that this can happen, then your nucleus now can be much simpler. It's a collection of protons and neutrons. There are no large magnetic moments, so that explains the magnetic moment as a combination of the proton and the neutron spins aligning in a certain way and then giving you a net magnetic moment. Uh, the neutron has spin one half, and the proton has uh, the spin it's supposed to have, one half. And then you can build your nuclei, and you can predict whether they're fermions or, and, and, and uh, bosons, and you can check if that idea works, and it works really well. So this is a, a very, very important uh, idea. Okay? And again, the price you pay for this is to say that this beta decay process is just a really complicated version of uh, electromagnetic radiation emission. And it's this radiation that allows the character of the particles to change. Okay? This is what was going on. And the other thing, which is perhaps even more important, is uh, uh, when Pauli wrote down this theory, the nicest thing about writing down a theory is that you can actually calculate something. If all you have is some uh, uh, philosophy, or if people are just talking about details and so on, but if you don't write down a mathematical theory, you can't calculate anything. But Pauli now gives you a model that you can do calculations with. And in particular, he calculated how you detect a neutrino. Because again, you can do neutron decay if you look at the diagram in some way, but you could do, say, electron, electron proton scattering into neutron neutrino. That would produce a neutrino if you want. The other thing you can do is you can run the movie this way, and you can do neutrino neutron scattering into proton electron. And this is nice. Because uh, you can calculate, uh, the, you know, oops, let me back up. This is nice because this is something I can observe. I, I can observe electrons and protons in an experiment. Okay? So, good. So you can do a calculation. So you can calculate what would it take to discover a neutrino. This is in 1934. And if you do the calculation, your conclusion will be it is never, ever going to happen. There is no physics experiment that you can conceive of that will give you enough neutrinos and that you can build a big enough detector and you can actually measure this neutrino flux, that you can measure neutrinos. Actually, uh, uh, there's another story that fi that's famous. Apparently, Pauli had a bet. It was a box of champagne, if I remember correctly. And his bet was that nobody would ever, ever be able to see a neutrino, period. He lost the bet. But it took a very long time. This is in 1930. The neutrinos discovered in 1956. So it took almost 30 years to see a neutrino. Uh, I will talk about serendipity in a peculiar way. But yeah, there's a big, big piece of uh, history that had to happen for the neutrino to be observable. That was actually the Second World War. The Second World War is required for neutrinos to be discovered. Not so nobody planned for that, but it happened. And, uh, but before I get into that, uh, and, and I think I have you know, maybe uh, 10 more minutes or so, uh, particle physics was really taking off at around the 1930s. That's kind of when particle physics is starting. It's kind of exciting because uh, for a long time, we only had two fundamental particles, the proton and the electron. We will lose the proton later on, but for now, it's a fundamental particle. Then we discovered the neutron, which is really exciting. And now people were getting clever. And now the next question that you would ask is, OK, so this nuclear is made out of protons and neutrons. So how do these things stick together? It's very confusing. But people were starting to become very, very clever. And in particular, we knew about how atoms would stick together. And they stick together by the electromagnetic force. So I want to invent something similar to explain how protons and neutrons stick together. 
There are lots of challenges there. One is that this is an interesting force that if you take two neutrons and you have them relatively far away, they do nothing. They don't interact at all. If you, if you bring them really close together, then they stick very strongly. Okay, so that hopefully everybody has this picture in mind. So you have what's called a very short range force. So you have a force that's really strong, but it falls off much faster than electromagnetism does. So electromagnetism is like gravity. It, the potential falls off like one over R. So you need a force that falls off much faster than one over R. And uh, this was the idea by uh, uh, Yukawa in the context of nuclear physics. He wrote down a potential that had a range with, which was associated with the range that people knew about nuclear forces. Now what's interesting is, uh, using the language of today, we know we can associate forces with particles, and the range of the force is associated with the mass of the particle. Okay, does that make sense for everybody? Okay, and the idea is you have a potential that looks like e to the minus alpha r over r, and it, this is the thing that makes the force very, very short range, because if r is much bigger than alpha, then the exponential is much, much stronger than the one over r. And you can do dimensional analysis, and you can rewrite this as a mass, or the inverse of a mass, and that tells you the mass of this new particle. So Yukawa wrote down a very, very naive model for nuclear force. It's called the Yukawa theory. We still use his name to talk about scalar interactions. And uh, he wrote down that potential. He looked at data about the range of nuclear forces, and he predicted the mass of this new particle. It's about 100 MeV. Okay, that's a very important number. So remember that number for what I'll say uh, before I, I stop in the next five minutes. So he predicted a new particle with a mass of about 100 MeV. Okay, now what's the name of this particle? Okay, this is called a meson. Okay, why is it called a meson? What's that? Yeah, that's exactly right, yeah. So the mass is between the electron mass and the, and the proton mass. So it's in the middle, so it's a meson. That's the name. Doesn't matter that we have B mesons, which are way heavier than the proton, but that's what that particle was. It's called the meson. It was also called the pi meson, so that's the pion. That's the particle that we describe today as a pion. Again, like I said, this is the, 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 the birth of particle physics. People started doing all kinds of interesting experiments. Uh, a few decades before, they had discovered cosmic rays. So cosmic rays are highly energetic particles that come for free from somewhere that we haven't figured out yet. So people started doing experiments with cosmic rays. And the year after Yukawa's 1935 theory, people discovered a new particle with a mass of 100 MeV in cosmic rays. This is absolutely amazing, right? I mean, imagine you write down a theory and you said, oh, there's a new particle with a mass of 100 MeV. Then these guys doing experiments in cosmic rays find a new particle which, with a mass of 100 MeV, which is absolutely phenomenal. By the way, this, would be a, this is an interaction that kind of looks like this. So you have a proton-proton current that interacts with a neutron, for example. That's a pion exchange interaction. But you can also have these charge exchange interactions as well. So people were already accustomed to this. So this particle can have charge. This, uh, this particle is either neutral or charged. And uh, it turns out that there, there's a charged version of that. That's the particle that was discovered had negative charge. So this was discovered in 1936, and then something funny happened. People started measuring the properties of this particle, and they were all wrong. And it's wrong in a complicated way. I don't want to talk about this too much. The main problem is, uh, so this particle interacts with protons and neutrons a lot. So again, if, if you're familiar with, say, uh, QED, you know that the strength of QED is governed by alpha, which is a fine structure constant which is 1 over 137, so everybody knows about that. The pion is similar, except that the equivalent of alpha is not 1 over 137, it's like 3. So it's way bigger. So the mystery, so this is the model for how this is happening. 
here's your detector on the planet here. Here's some cosmic ray coming from somewhere. It hits the atmosphere. So it's a very high energy collision. And then you produce one of these particles called a pion. And then the pion makes it all the way to your detector. That's the model, except that the pion is really strongly interacting. There is no way that the pion can cross all of this atmosphere before you can get in, in, in detected in this detector. So the properties were all wrong. This is a really big puzzle. Uh, it took 10 years to sort this out. Okay? And the solution turns out to be that this was the wrong particle. It's a different particle. It's called a, this is a particle that today we call the muon. By the way, if you talk to older people, some people might refer to the muon as the mu meson. And you should be very confused by that because the muon is not a meson. It's not made of quarks, but it's called the mu meson because of this story. Because the, it was found to be a different particle. And it turns out that for this to be the muon, you also have to, this story has to be partially correct. Because you don't get to produce a muon in the atmosphere given everything that we know about muons. Because again, the muons are very weakly interacting as opposed to the, the pions. So you have to produce a pion first, and then the pion has to decay into a muon. So this is what happens, by the way, is that the pion decays that way. And you can see why this is really hard to figure out. Because you have a particle that's produced in the right way, but it's propagating in the wrong way. So that took a very long time. There's a lot of people associated with this discovery. and. Uh, it comes, if you like to read history, this was the so-called two-meson hypothesis. So basically, you needed the pion to be produced like a pion, but you needed it to propagate like something else, and that's called the two-meson hypothesis. And uh, just to finish this part of the story, uh, because I'll, I'll, I'll continue after lunch, the, there's lots of fun questions you can ask. Where, how was the pion directly produced? And the idea, you can look at this drawing and solve the problem here. One is that you, you build a mountain and you do the experiment here. Fortunately, there are mountains, so you don't have to build any of them. You just have to take your detector all the way up the mountain. And that's what people did. You know, so there are these very famous cosmic ray experiments with a Brazilian participation in them, it turns out. And uh, that's how they discovered the pion. And of course, the other thing that you had to do is you had to start building better detectors. You know, People were not using photographic plates anymore, but they had to use a, so the, the detector development was actually crucial for, say, the discovery of the pion. And then the other thing that was happening at the same time, starting in the 40s and the 50s, is that we started building accelerators. And then we didn't need the cosmic rays anymore. We could make our own cosmic rays. And then we could do experiments in that way. And that turned out to be a big deal. The one thing which is important for this is that, uh, a uh, pion decay is also associated with a neutrino. So the description of pion decay requires the existence of a neutrino, and that's the thing which I'll start from uh, uh, afterwards. Okay, so I'll, I'll stop here because we want to have lunch. So we have time for one question, and then we continue with questions in the afternoon. Okay, this is a bad sign, but let's see afternoon what happens. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Andrea. Mm -hmm. So, uh, well, now we have a discussion about the experiments, and then we can all go for lunch. Yes. So oh, hi everybody. Good morning. Uh, before going to the lunch, uh, normally in the next days we will have uh, the discussion of the poster that you will present. Is not there? Okay. Fine. Okay. 
I, I don't like that, but okay. Uh, so you will discuss the poster that we will present. This is going to start from tomorrow. So today we will use the, this 30 minutes just to present very quickly. I think that most of you already went to the web page and read the, the abstract, but to discuss a little about the, the experiment. So let's uh, start, I put in this order, but let me uh, start from the end. That is how we will organize the experiment part. So we will do one experiment each day. You will do one experiment each day. We have a set of 10 experiments. That means that you need to choose your five experiments. But since you are a lot, it's very difficult to give exactly the five experiments that you will like to do. So we, for organizing this, we will try to give you the most as we can. But for this, we will need to have a ranking of all the experiment. The, the most that you want to do, you will put the, the number one. And the one that you really don't want to do, <laughs> you will put the 10. Oh, you don't need to do, because you already work on that, uh, what is nice, OK? So uh, this we will do on Wednesday. So we will prepare a, a sheet for every one of you. You will fill that, if the, uh, rank in the experiment, put your name, and I will work on that and we will come out with your uh, schedule for next week for the experiment on friday so on friday you will have your cr own chronogram eh? this is personalized that means that also we want you to change groups just you can interact as much as you can in the different uh, setup of a, a small group in each setup so we have 10 experiments but some of those experiments have more than one setup so that means that we will have for each afternoon like eight or nine uh, students. So this makes that everybody would pass for the experiment. OK, so choose really what you like. Uh, my advice is, for example, there's we will review this now, but we will have some experiment that use the same technique, like the immune decay that you scintillator and then the cosmic ray measure because of background for neutrinos and um, dark matter searches that are very well seen, the cosmic ray. So we need to understand the cosmic ray. That's why we have also an experiment on cosmic ray. But both use scintillators. So don't put this at the first and the second, because that doesn't make sense. You will not gain so much by doing that. So try to, uh, to look at the experiment and try to do a, a, a choose, a Try, trying to take one of different techniques or, or, or detectors for, for, each of, of, uh, for each day that you will do. So the 10 experiments that we have, in fact, we have nine experiments plus one data analysis. Uh, so the first experiment is relating with background too. So we will use, a, we will characterize the gamma background. We will use a scintillate, um, a, a, what is the name? A, sodium iodide detectors, so we will work with source, uh, radioactive source, we will calibrate, we will study the energy resolution, and uh, the idea then we will do a characterization of the background in the lab, okay? So this is, uh, will be done by Federico, so I'll put the name of all the professors. So in some groups, more people will prepare the experiment, but they will not uh, able to come here. So this will be done by Federico from Argentina, and he will bring the detector. The second experiment, uh, we will keep these numbers because it's the way that we will refer. So we will use the number of the experiment. This is a, an illustration of time projection chamber. It's a new experiment in Brazil because uh, this was developed in 2012 by a professor at Fermilab, and they used for a school there, and then nobody used this. So we rebuilt uh, these detectors, they were uh, like abandoned. And this is very nice because most of you, some of you are working in this new neutrinos experiment or dark matter experiment that use the time projection chamber. So it's a way to understand the physics associated with that. Uh, we will use a uh, gas, argon gas inside, and we will see the drift of the electrons in this uh, small chamber. So for this, we are mounting three se experimental setup. Maybe we will have a fourth one, but we need to confirm uh, this week. So prepare those experiments are not easy. So uh, this is a, a most of you will be able to do this experiment, and is is the only experiment that we have of this kind. 
So then we have another experiment that is related also with the detection of the neutrino and dark matter that is uh, the uh, use CCDs as a particle detector. And there's uh, two experiments, one is Damic, and there's people from Damic here. And the other experiment is CONI, that is the CCD that we have at the Angra reactor. So this uh, experiment is uh, exactly the same detector, and you will be able to, par to play with the, the, the particles, background particles that we record there, and see how the CCD works and how we analyze this data. Next week also we will have a lecture on CCD's uh, uh, detection. This is more related to, to cosmic rays, so we will use scintillators and we will uh, follow the, the discovery of the extensive air shower done by Pierre Auger in the, uh, in the beginning of the last century. Um, so, uh, and this is important to understand the, the background that we have because we cannot eliminate cosmic ray from our detectors and not all the experiments are in the in the underground laboratory. So this is very important just to, to characterize the background uh, of uh, that we have. So and this is used a uh, plastic scintillation. Okay. Then one detector that is very important is silicon PM PMs, PMTs for the multipliers were used many, many years. This is rather a 10 years, last 10 years technology. More experiments are using this kind of detector. So the idea of this experiment is just to show how the silicon PM works and which are the, the reminding problems of this technology that the worst one is the temperature response. So you will play with the, the, the different uh, designs of silicon PM and you will measure some uh, 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 luciferium uh, the light emitted by the luciferium, just to characterize that and uh, to understand how it depends. And also you will hit the system just to see the silicon PM uh, response. Also related with silicon PM is the Arapuca. Arapuca is a, a new concept of a, a, of a light collection detector that uses PMT, but they design a trump. And this is very new one and is very challenging. This will be installed in most of the time projection uh, chamber experiment for the light collection of the uh, 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 emitted in the argon. And this is very interesting because it's an idea that is being developed at Unicampi by a prof uh, Brazilian professor. So uh, they will bring a detector and you will play and you will understand all the uh, characteristics of this detector by trapping these uh, photons and then reading the photons with a ceiling PM. So this, uh, okay, you have the trump, but we will have also uh, something relating with uh, silicon PM detection. And then this is a, an experiment that will allow two experimental setups. Uh, is a more electronics, let's say, because you will play with uh, FPGAs because we need to take data. We need to understand how data taking works. And these uh, uh, FPGA devices will be connected also to PM. So you will work with photomultipliers and with silicon PM at the same time. And you will do some data taking and analyze a single photoelectron. That is a way that we can calibrate those uh, detectors. Uh, then, well, I, I, I think that after the, the first lecture from, from Andre, I don't need to say anything because this is the idea is an experiment that was developed for, uh, from people from the, uh, the uh, Rio University, from the uh, uh, UFRG. Um, the idea of this experiment is just to, to exemplify and to show uh, how the, the experiment of the neutrino discovered. So you will uh, work with uh, uh, electron emission source, beta emission, that is the strontium 19 source, in a magnetic field, and you will try to uh, measure the end point of the, of, the, of the spectrum. So I don't know so much of, of, of this experiment, so I don't tell you so much. I am very curious to see how it works. I, I saw some pictures. There's one student from this school that was helping on that, and this is Victor. So if you have questions, you can ask to, to, to Victor, because I, I cannot say so much about that. But I think it's 
could be a very nice experiment. And this is also a scintillator experiment that is working in coincidence, and the idea is to measure the time of the muon decay. So here you will learn how to uh, recognize a pattern of a signature for this muon decay, and then to measure the time, the characteristic time of the muon decay. So you will learn scintillator, PMTs, data take it, coincidence, beta, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this also is scintillator. So is the same technology than the experiment of the cosmic ray backgrounds. And also we will have one analysis, uh, data analysis, not experiment, because it's difficult to, to reproduce an experiment like that, but uh, Rodrigo Nemen will teach how to take data from the Fermi uh, Observatory, uh, analyze this data, so you will learn some tools of data analysis. If you are interested in doing that, even if you don't know if you will have it. This is, uh, I, I think we can, uh, we don't have a limitation of the student per experiment. So if all of you wants to do, I, I will be able to uh, put all of you in the experiment. But for that, you need to install uh, some, um, some programs and some things to, to read and to analyze the data. So here you have the instruction. This is in the web page. So you can uh, start to download and install all this and down Download the data. What do you want to? It's a comment that there there are computers that will have all these installed. So if you don't have a laptop, oh, yeah. you can still do this uh, this experiment. Th there will be computers with everything installed. So thanks. So uh, everybody will be allowed to do that. Even uh, the 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 participants that will not do the full school, this would be able to do because we have room for that. So the idea is. Think about the experiment, read. If you have questions, talk with us at any moment. Edivaldo, uh, Martin can help a little. I'm here all the time. So try to talk with us and uh, if you need help to decide what to do. And on Wednesday, you will do the, the record, OK? Um, um, I don't know if you have any question. Otherwise, I'm going to stop here. So just a couple of comments before we go to lunch. Uh, actually, for, for the lunch, there is a map. Uh, there is no uh, place to have lunch at IFT, right? But there are, very, uh, there are few close by restaurants that are very good. So you have probably a map, and you can work yourself away to that. And there is the canteen, which now is on vacation. So it should be OK to go there to the canteen. No, I, I'm asking. Yeah? OK, so there is a canteen downstairs. Okay, thanks. Also, regarding the posters, as you heard, we'll have three poster sessions, right? Tomorrow, uh, Thursday, and Friday. And in the web page, you have a list of the poster abstracts and the day they will be presented. Actually, the web page has a lot of information that's being updated every day. So just take a look at the web page. Uh, the talks will be posted there. When the videos uh, are on online, they will be there. Um, so there are some little changes in the program uh, often, unfortunately, so they are there. So that's your primary source of information, is the web page of the event. Also, if you, want, if you need any information and you want to contact anyone from the organizing committee, well, you already know Fabio that gave uh, the first lecture, you know Carla that just spoke about the experiments, there is, there is Edivaldo there, uh, and myself, so if you have questions about the school, just, just look for one of us. And yes, I think we are ready to go to lunch. And we'll be back today at 2.30. Uh, pay attention because you know, today, tomorrow, we, we, we are back at 2.30. On Wednesday is, the, is a colloquium. This colloquium will be at 2 p.m. So don't get, don't get confused on Wednesday, OK? OK, thanks, and see you later. <laughs>